This Filmmaker IQ course is proudly sponsored by HP and the HPZ Workstation. Limitless potential to let you innovate without boundaries. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com and today we're going to take a deep look at rendering computer generated imagery or CGI and trace the improvements and techniques that bring us photorealistic imagery. The fundamental question at the heart of computer graphics is this. How do we get what is essentially a super powerful adding machine, a computer, to generate a photorealistic rendering? Well, the answer to that question is math. This means geometry, 3D coordinates, vector math, and the matrix. Well, not quite that matrix, but matrices. Now, before you run off thinking this is a graduate math course, we're not going to get into any of the math in a meaningful way. This stuff is too far from even what I'm comfortable with. Just remember that every procedure we're going to talk about in layman's terms has to be not only described mathematically using coordinates, vectors, and matrices, but also in a computer language that the machines can understand. So this art is a blend of mathematics and computer science and programming. Let's get started with the most basic approach to creating 3D graphics. Say we have some empty 3D space, and we have three points in that space which define a triangle, a very useful and simple polygon for CGI. If we look straight at this triangle in 2D space, drawing this triangle on a computer screen is fairly straightforward, but we want a 3D perspective. In the real world, a paper triangle would scatter light rays in all directions. But for a computer to calculate all those infinitely scattered light rays, that would be simply out of the question, especially in the 1960s when computer scientists first began to tackle this very question. The thing is, we really don't care about all the light rays. We only care about the ones that end up in our eye or in our camera. So let's add a camera to our 3D space, a point of perspective. And in front of that point of the perspective, let's put a screen grid where each box is one pixel of our rendered image. Now, instead of drawing an infinite number of light rays from each vertex of the triangle, let's only draw one ray that intersects with our camera's perspective point. Where these rays intersect our screen, will be the boundaries for our view of this triangle. We'll mark off the left uppermost intersection and the right lowermost intersection. We know our triangles in this box. Now we can go through each pixel in our box and ask the computer, does that pixel contain part of the projected triangle? If it does, we'll shade that pixel in based on the materials and shading properties applied to that object. If not, we'll leave it blank. And with that, our triangle, which existed in 3D object space, is now in two-dimensional rasterized image space. This projection rasterization method was the main focus of research by computer graphics scientists of the 1970s, and is still part of the graphics pipeline of GPUs that run OpenGL and DirectX for modern gaming, although obviously it's gotten much, much more sophisticated since then. Ray casting is an alternative process to rasterization, but it was originally considered too cumbersome to employ when it was first presented in a paper by Arthur Apple working for IBM in 1968. Well, let's go back to our 3D object space, but this time we'll add a second triangle. Where rasterization is object-centric, meaning we draw rays from the object to the camera, ray casting is, is image-centric. If we're only interested in the rays that actually make it into the camera, why not trace those rays back out from the camera? Now this time, we'll start with our imaginary camera and draw one ray through every pixel in our image grid. Now we'll check each ray against every single object in our object space and look for intersections. If a ray runs into more than one object, we'll only take the closest intersection. 
This process right off the bat solves a potential visibility problem that plagued the rasterization technique. See, computers are really, really dumb. If you just rasterize two overlapping objects, whatever was drawn last would show up in front, even if it's supposed to be in the back. The solution for rasterization was a technique called Z-buffer, which created a depth map and then checked everything against that depth map. But ray casting automatically solves the visibility problem. And the math for figuring out intersections between rays and polygons is actually pretty simple in a lot of cases, especially for triangles. The problem, the very, very big problem, was you had to check every ray against every object. Say we had a thousand by 1000 pixel image. That's a megapixel and a million rays to check. And if we have a thousand polygons in the scene, which is really very low, then we would have to check those million rays against each one of those 1000 polygons. Now there are some strategies for cutting down the workload, but that's still a lot of calculations that need to be made. And for this reason, ray casting was ignored for most of the 1970s. But there were three big hurdles that nobody could seem to solve really well with rasterization method. How do we simulate good shadows, good reflections, and good refractions? The solution would be to come back to ray casting and add a new twist on this old technique, a twist that would require even more computational power. In 1980, an engineer working at Bell Laboratories named Turner Witted released a paper at SIGGRAPH entitled An Improved Illumination Model for Shaded Display, which single-handedly solved the shadow, reflection, and refraction problems. Witted's technique called recursive ray tracing starts with a ray cast from the camera as before. Now, these are called primary rays. But when the primary rays make contact with a surface, Witted has us drawing secondary rays. To solve the shadow issue, we draw a shadow ray by drawing a secondary ray in the direction of the lights that are in the object space. If we find that there are no objects between the light and the surface, then we know that that light is directly illuminating the surface. So when we go to color in that pixel, we will include specular and highlight values created by that light. If we find that there is an object between the light and the surface, we know that surface is in shadow, and we shade that pixel using only the ambient light value. Now, if that surface is reflective, we'll draw a reflection ray using the angle of incidence and see where this reflection ray lands. The information from this reflection ray will change how we shade this pixel. Now, if that reflection ray lands on an object, we again have to draw new secondary rays from this new intersection, so on and so on, which is why this is called recursive ray tracing. Now, similar process is needed if the object is transparent. Instead of using, an, instead of using angle of incidence, we use the index of refraction to determine the new angle of the refractive ray that we have to draw. So, as you can see, the solution to making ray casting better was to draw and analyze a whole lot more rays. Now, this is one of Turner Witted's very first ray traced images from his paper in 1980. In this image, we see shadows, reflections, and refractions. This 512 by 512 image took 74 minutes to render. Now, Witted's paper signaled a fundamental shift in computer graphics research. We now had at least the base for photorealistic rendering in place. Unlike rasterization, recursive ray tracing is actually modeling the behavior of real light rays as they bounce around the real world, but it wasn't perfect. Intensive study began in the field, and much of the processing power in computer science laboratories began running ray tracing algorithms. The next step to the photorealistic puzzle was to go all in and really simulate the laws of light. In 
Even though ray tracing produced very realistic shadows, reflections, and refractions, there's still major stumbling blocks before we can call an image truly photorealistic. Issues like motion blur and depth of field could be solved relatively easily, but the most challenging simulation, and perhaps the most important one, is something called indirect illumination. Direct illumination is when the light is directly hitting and then reflected by an object. But in the real world, light doesn't only come from a light source. Light bounces and scatters from practically everything. If you stand next to a red wall, you will receive some bounced red light. That's why filmmakers can use bounce cards and reflectors to add light to a shot. But a real basic ray tracing algorithm doesn't consider all the sources of bounced light. It really just focuses on the main source of light, the direct illumination. In 1986, James Kajia published a paper called The Rendering Equation. Now, building on the basics of ray tracing, we now have a mathematical equation based on the laws of conservation of energy and Maxwell's equations to properly simulate the light that should be perceived at every pixel of our image. This is physics in something a computer can work with. The reflected light we perceive from any given point is a sum of the light from all directions multiplied by the surface scattering and the bi-directional reflectance distribution function. That's a big word. <laughs> Even though this rendering equation had some limitations like it didn't handle transmission and subsurface scattering well, it's much better representation of reality. But this integral right here is massively difficult to calculate. So a number of tactics were used to try to find a shortcut to those calculations. The earliest attempts were radiosity, which tried to render basic ray traced images from a number of different angles and then average them all together. But this wasn't great for anything more than just previewing. A mathematical process called Monte Carlo integration can be used, which is a probabilistic method of approximation where you solve the integral by averaging a large number of random values. Now, Monte Carlo is in part is part of tactics like path tracing, bidirectional ray tracing, photon mapping, metropolis light transport, and many, many more, which we won't go into because that's way above my scope. But the cost of trying to get closer and closer to simulating reality of light is computational power. Even though Pixar's first full-length, fully CGI film, Toy Story, came out in 1995, it wasn't until a decade later with Cars, released in 2006, when Pixar fully implemented ray tracing in their rendering pipeline before they use scanline rasterization with some clever tricks. That's how complicated this process can get. Still, what took Turner Witted 74 minutes to render in 1980 can be done in a 30th of a second with today's real-time ray tracing, thanks in part to Moore's Law, an observation that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit doubles every two years or so. However, to balance out Moore's Law, there is something called Blinn's Law, which states, as technology advances, rendering time remains constant. The more our machines are capable of, the more we throw at them. Which is a good moment here to thank our sponsor, HP, and their powerful line of HP Z workstations. As we ask our machines to do more and more, the HP Z workstation is there to deliver the power you need to take your innovation to new heights. At heart, all film is a special effect. From the earliest silent short to today's digital creations, it's just a bunch of 2D images flashed in quick succession to trick the brain into thinking we're seeing motion. But filmmakers, just like magicians, have been hard at work making that magic trick better. Introducing cutting, matte painting, compositing, green screen, miniatures, puppets, and now photorealistic computer-generated imagery. 
Unfortunately, we've gotten so used to the magic trick, so jaded that these amazing models of optics and light physics needed to create stunning CGI is now considered lazy filmmaking compared to old fashioned techniques. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the old fashioned filmmaking techniques, but how can you look at the monumental task of getting a, a calculator to produce an image and not be amazed by all the mathematics, engineering, and computer science that has been accomplished in the last half century. But more importantly, these tools enable all of us to do what was only once in the realm of a very few well-equipped and well-funded individuals. CGI is a tool, an amazing tool. Every other visual art form involves the manipulation of some natural phenomenon, but CGI is born completely from the ground up out of our own human imagination. We said, here's how we want it to work, and we made it. How can you not be amazed by the potential of human ingenuity? And when we employ that power in movies to enhance and support the story, it can open up whole new worlds of possibilities for the narrative. We need to change the way we talk about CGI. It's just a tool, like a paintbrush or a man in a rubber suit. It can be done really, really well, or it can be done really poorly. A CGI can help a filmmaker answer the question, how do I get this shot? But it can never shed light on why. That is ultimately our job as storytellers. And that fact hasn't changed over the years, whether it's a completely CGI shot or a completely practical effect. All that matters is what's on the screen. How the magic trick is done is really nothing more than a piece of trivia. So go out there and make something great. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at FilmmakerIQ.com.